Hello and welcome to the Football Code Business Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Manby, and today I'm talking to Darren Eels, president of Atlanta United, and to date, as far as I'm aware anyway, the only guest on this podcast to have performed with rapper, whacker, flocker, flame. Having previously worked in English football at Tottenham Hotspur, Darren became Atlanta United's first hire when the club was founded in 2014 and has been instrumental in its marketing efforts that have seen an extraordinarily rapid growth in the club's fan base. The MLS as a league, of course, continues to grow and it does so in its own way, now regularly cited as the US's fourth most popular sport by audience. Average attendances at MLS games have risen steadily and now rank comfortably in the top 10 football leagues in the world. And Atlanta United are leading the charge with average home attendances of over 50,000 fans and sometimes reaching numbers as high as 70,000. It's an impressive achievement in such a short space of time, particularly in the context of how long established European clubs have been around for. And I'm keen to understand what it's due to and how far it can go. So without further ado, Darren, welcome to the show. Hi, Alex. Thanks for having me on. Now, Darren, it's striking to me just how young MLS clubs are. We're talking about years, not decades or centuries. You worked in English football, where conversations around history and heritage are pervasive and important. Does it feel very different to be at a club less than 10 years old? Yeah, I mean, it was a really interesting challenge when it, it came to me, because obviously I was at Tottenham Hotspur, and as you know, you know, clubs over 100 years old with great history, and it was an opportunity to go into Atlanta and start a club from scratch, so totally from scratch. We weren't a club that was playing in the USL and then stepping up into the, the Major League Soccer. We were literally a total brand new club. So that idea of going somewhere and you've got to create everything. So whether that's the, the name, the crest, the kit, you know, what your know, kit color is going to be, what's the identity going to be, how are you going to set in place some traditions uh, around the match day entertainment. So all of that was something that was really intriguing to me and it was something that you know, I felt was a challenge. And what we were really fortunate, Alex, in Atlanta was with Atlanta United, our owner is Arthur Blank. So Arthur Blank founded a company called Home Depot, which is the biggest, you know, one of the biggest retailers in the world now. Uh, it's sort of like the B&Q in, in England, a DIY store. Um, and so Arthur was someone that had been an entrepreneur and knew what about launching a club and you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. And I think when we came in, it was unusual because I came on board two years before we started, which was actually quite a long time. I think traditionally clubs had said, okay, we want to try and sort of hire people as late as possible because we're not getting the revenues from the match day. But Arthur took a view of, I want to try and build something here that's world-class. So he hired me as employee number one, and then I was set to task in building up the, the infrastructure. But yeah, it is incredible to think that, I mean, Atlanta United, we're going into our sixth season. We've only been around for six years. Uh, and yet this year we're averaging 51,000. So we're seventh in the world. And Spurs, my old club, are at number six and Barcelona's number eight. So it's not too, not bad two clubs to be nestled between. Do you think that we Europeans can sometimes be a bit snooty and condescending about the MLS? I think so. I think, um, look, I mean, definitely when I came over, you know, I had that perspective, the sort of the English perspective of soccer in America. I think the slight difference for me is I played back in 94, 95 when the league was starting up. Um, so I'd seen the that time when they tried to Americanize soccer. And I use soccer because we have an American football team as well, um, the Atlanta Falcons. But, but football in America, the theory was Americans just don't get it. It's not high scoring enough. So I remember playing for a team that was in, based in New York called the New York Centaurs. Uh, and so we were playing music during the game, um, trying things like kick-ins instead of throw-ins. And the problem was it was neither fish nor foul. If you were a real football fan, you came to one of our games, you thought, ah, oh, this is a bit naff, it's a bit American. And if you weren't a football fan, just playing music or trying these little gimmicks wasn't really going to convert you. So what I like about Major League Soccer, and I think what it's done well is, it's been now 27 years and counting, but we just kept it real, authentic, how the game is in the rest of the world. And almost America and the rest of the world has caught up. So now it's a much younger, more diverse sort of population in America. There's lots of young people, globalization of the world. And, you know, football is the world's game. And so they're coming to Atlanta United matches. And it's, you know, honestly, come to a game where we've got 70,000. 
the chance, you know, we take some from South American culture, some are from the American football culture in, in America, some are from European, but it, it's a unique sort of Atlanta flavor to the world's game. And that's what I really like about uh, MLS is it's forging its own identity. And I think now we have a confidence that perhaps in the past, there was a lot of focus on how do we win over the, almost we call them the soccer snobs, those elite people that will watch Champions League and think Major League Soccer is not a great standard. Uh, we don't really try to convert those. We just go and get those fans that are interested in Atlanta United. And to be honest, you know, when you see players like Miguel Almiron, Jose Martinez out on the pitch and, you know, coaches like Tata Martino coaching the team, then the fans that know football genuinely appreciate that it's a great sort of product on the pitch now. Music during games I can't get on board with. Kick-ins, maybe. The thing that I bring back, and actually I think it was from the... NASL to precursor to the MLS, the um the penalty shootouts where you have to dribble with the ball before scoring it. I think that's fantastic. I'd bring that back in a heartbeat. Um, but Darren, it sounds like you were pretty quick then to get over any personal prejudices you might have had. You overcame those reasonably easily and clearly understood the potential of the MLS when you moved over there. But what I'm interested in is what made you believe in the Atlanta project? Was there any research or insight how confident were you that the fan base was there? Because, as you said, you started from absolute scratch and you're trying to build a franchise that's going to compete with some pretty major sporting organisations in the other uh, Atlanta teams, the, the, the Falcons, for example, the Braves in MLB. Yeah, no, I mean, it was, it was an interesting one because when uh, Atlanta got the expansion franchise, so 2014, April, Major League Soccer awarded Atlanta the franchise, there were a number of articles written at the time that, that was a mistake. So the perception was that soccer in the South, so, you know, just wasn't necessarily considered to be something that would be successful. I think Atlanta in particular as a market was seen as a fickle sports market. So the issue with Atlanta, it's an amazing, young, diverse, fast growing city, 7 million plus and growing in the metro Atlanta area, but it's a very transient population. People have moved from elsewhere. And I think the perception was uh, it got a, an unfair reputation because if you came from Chicago, you know, you'd be a Chicago Bulls fan because of Michael Jordan. You'd be a Bears fan, you know, just because of the history in, uh, in the city. And so what tended to happen is when teams were playing in Atlanta, uh, you'd find that the fans would actually show up for the opposition because it was their chance to see the Bulls when they were in town or the Bears, depending on the sport. I think what we were able to do is make Atlanta United Atlanta's city and Atlanta's team. So you know, you come to Atlanta from somewhere else, people love the city, but you carry the baggage of your former sort of teams, whether that's the NFL team, your Major League Baseball team, NBA team. But Atlanta United is the way you show your passion for the city. And what I find, Alex, is amazing. Even now, I'll drive around the city and the number of cars with bumper stickers that might be a Green Bay Packers, Atlanta United. It might be a, like I said, Chicago Bulls, Atlanta United. But what I think we did a really good job was saying, look, guys, in this city, you don't bring a soccer team with you. It's just not really, you know, the league hasn't been around long enough, but Atlanta United can be the team that you're proud of. And I think that was something that we were able to, to hit on. And I think, you know, we were still surprised. And we've got to be honest, I remember talking with Arthur Blank, our owner, early on, and we were hoping to get to 30,000. So we play Mercedes-Benz Stadium, fantastic stadium we have downtown, holds about 70,000. And we thought the lower bowl is around 30,000. That was going to be our aim. We thought that would be quite aggressive. I must admit at the time, I was a bit nervous that would we get to, to 30,000. But then as we were building the club, before we'd actually played our first game, we were getting towards 26, 27,000 season ticket holders. So we knew we were going to be bigger than that. So what we do at Mercedes-Benz Stadium is the lower two bowls is about 42,500. So we will play, our, we call it our soccer-specific stadium. We put curtains down. So where we have the upper bowl, actual curtains come down, Atlanta United branded. And that's really good because it, it creates an atmosphere that feels like our stadium. It feels different from going to the, a match with the Falcons. And it's a total sellout. And with the roof that we have, the noise is just, you know, ridiculous inside the stadium because it bounces and, and stays within. And then we choose between three to six games a season where we go to 70,000. And the idea behind that is we always want there to be a sellout stadium. So we're in our sixth season. We sold out every game we've ever had. So when you come to an Atlanta United game, unlike the other sports in America, it's noisy, it's passionate, and it's driven by the supporters. That's the big difference between 
soccer in this country in America and the other sports is you're not told when to cheer. You know, in American football, they'll put signs up saying defense and you're almost orchestrating the crowd to cheer. With us, we have a supporter section, 5,000. Um, the Gulch is our area of our six different supporters groups that come together, but they drive the energy. They drive the chance. They drive the cheering. And that's something when, when we bring fans in for the first time, they just can't believe the atmosphere and the energy because there's nothing like it in other American sports. So these 5,000 or even these 40,000 or even on big days, these 70,000 fans, what were they doing 10 years ago, you know, before Atlanta United was founded? Were they fans of other MLS teams and you've now convinced them, leave that at the door, you're now an Atlanta fan? Or were they not soccer fans or were they soccer fans of European teams? Do you have any insight into that? Yeah, so it's a mixture of all of that. And um, it's interesting, as we built the club, so I spoke about the the season ticket base we got. Um, we basically grew that organically. So what happened was we announced that we got a, a new team coming. We didn't have a team name then. We had obviously no players, no coach. But we, we talked about, you know, at that stage, it was MLS Atlanta 2017. Then we got the name Atlanta United. And at that launch event, that was just about 19 months before we were starting to play. We launched it downtown in an indoor-outdoor nightclub. We had about 5,000 fans came. We were right in the sort of trendy part of town, the West Midtown area that was growing. And that, I think, was a moment where we felt we were connecting and onto something special because the buzz around that, the coverage that we got in the media just on launching a team name that had been leaked. So everyone knew it was going to be Atlanta United, but everyone came for the party. And, and what, you know, when we write the book and we laugh and say, we'll call it Pub Crawl Your Way to Success, but what we did was we just met the fans wherever they were. So every Premier League team, has a pub in the Atlanta metro area. So the Manchester United supporters will meet at Fado's downtown. The Spurs will meet at a bar called Meehan's in you know, West Midtown. So what was happening is we were going, I would be going out Saturday mornings, meeting with the supporters, just sort of getting them ready and excited about Atlanta United coming. Because the great thing is everyone can have their Premier League team, but the only team you can actually watch live in the city is Atlanta United. So that was how we focused and we did grassroots events anywhere we could. So Mexico played a Gold Cup game in the city. We used that as a chance to engage with those fans. And what we found happening was we were starting to build that fan base. And the really interesting thing, I think we called it Grass Thriller. So we took grassroots marketing and guerrilla marketing because we didn't have the budget of uh, Atlanta Braves or even the Falcons, our sister club here in, uh, here in Atlanta. So we were trying to be creative. So one of the big things in Atlanta is they have um, neighborhoods and they have parades. So they love to have a parade. The weather here is great nearly the whole year round. Uh, and there's a famous one that's downtown called the Inman Park Festival. And so we talked to them about sponsoring it. And I think they wanted like 80 grand, which would have been our budget for the whole year. So we said, look, we, we won't do that, but can we put a float into the parade? And they said, yeah, no problem. So the week before we handed out garden flags, which is a big thing in the South, especially for college American football. So we gave Atlanta United flags out to the whole neighborhood. So by the time we came to the parade, and you could see it was a bit like um, Lawrence of Arabia when he was coming in from the distance, the sort of mirage, there was this smoke and you could hear the drums and smoke from a mile away. And as they came through the festival, 200 of our supporters, just with flares and smoke, everyone really upset in the shop, you know, because it's all uh, sort of foodie and shops. So they were all upset. But the buzz we got from that, because again, it was creating an event for our fans, but the city's watching and saying, what the heck is this going on? And, you know, everyone thought we'd sponsor that event because we had the flags up everywhere. But that moment, again, this was like a year before we were going to be playing. We knew that this was something that our, you know, the city and particularly that younger millennial demographic was really behind. And I think, you know, by the time we got to that first game, we sold out Bobby Dodd Stadium, which is a historic downtown stadium because Mercedes-Benz was slightly delayed in getting built. Getting built. We had 55,000 in that first game. And it was that moment that you knew that this was something now that was going to be identified with the city. And back then, and even to this day, did you feel like you were fighting against the Braves and the Falcons for audience attention and that you could, it was, it was you or them in terms of uh, any member of the public's favourite team? Or is it a multi-sport audience who will pop over onto the Mercedes-Benz on a Saturday to see the, the Falcons and then be back there the following day for NFL Sunday? It was different. I think, Alex, that was the thing that probably surprised me the most. So I think when I came in and I was thinking, you know, back of a napkin, how are we going to get to, at one stage, 30,000? 
in my head, I assumed, okay, you've got a Falcon season ticket base. We'll take, you know, 25% of them will come to watch, you know, another sport in the same building. Our crossover is about 6%. It's very low. It's just a totally different audience. And I think even with baseball, baseball's a much older demographic. And the, the insight I got is quite interesting. So as we were going into Mercedes-Benz Stadium, we wanted to have food and drink options that were from Atlanta that our fans wanted. So we actually, you know, did a poll of the Falcons fans from everything, you know, what beers do you want in here? What's your favorite restaurant from a hot dog, hamburger, you know, all of the various different areas. Uh, and it was really insightful because that, to me, gives you the best way to describe the difference between our fan bases. So what beer do you want? Bud Light, really. Falcons is a Bud Light audience. For Atlanta United, almost four to one, it was craft beer. So, you know, you could see straight away from that question. The other one that I want to bet on because I knew it was we have a chain of uh, coffee shops at the time called Octane Coffee. Very hipster coffee. There's about eight of them in downtown. Uh, and so my bet was, I bet you Octane is going to be higher than Starbucks because even if the people like Starbucks, our audience, they're going to say they like Octane because it's the sort of hip one to like. And it was absolutely true. You know, I think it was like 90% Starbucks favorite coffee for Falcons. And yet Octane was the top one from our fans. So it's just a different audience. And I think that was probably the most eye-opening thing for us as we built the club was we had a ready-made audience out there. It just hadn't got that opportunity to to almost show itself, to be be that sort of, like I said, a little bit more younger, diverse, and they want to have ownership. It's a, you know, the fans of Atlanta United, you know, they own the club. They're the ones, like I said, that drive what happens at game days. It's They don't want to be told what to do. They want to like be their own bosses, so to speak. And I think that was something we were able to tap into. You're talking, you're starting to talk about culture here and the culture of a club, and it's something that I'm keen to delve into because it's an important part of I think any football club really I mean all clubs play on the uniqueness of where they're from uh, you see the marketing spiel when a new shirt comes out and it will say that you know this part of the design comes from you know the heritage of the city the workers of previous decades or you know similar with the a new club crest you get it with um, halftime songs in the stadium it will be from a local artist etc etc with Atlanta you had a blank sheet of paper to start this from, how did you identify the key parts of the city's identity, which you would then bring into the club's identity, into this new culture that you were creating? Well, I think in some respects, that was an advantage of starting the club up from scratch because we did have that blank sheet of paper. And we have six core values that Arthur Blank, our owner, brought from his Home Depot days. And one of them is listen and respond. And I think, you know, for me, Arthur Blank was a great mentor because it's a very interesting proposition. It sounds simple, you know, listen to your customers, listen to your supporters and respond. But, but it's really important. And Arthur, you know, we talked about it a lot. You know, first thing is listen. So listen means listen to actually what the supporters are saying, not to what you think the supporters are saying. So it's very easy in business to say, okay, I'm going to go and take um, focus groups and get a poll of supporters, my, you know, my customers but you've already got a slant on what you think the answer is and you sort of take the bits that fit what you want to do and you sort of ignore those that don't. And Arthur was, you know, was very big on, look, whatever they tell us, we're going to try and do. We're not going to just sort of have, you know, that we know better than our, our supporters. Uh, and we had that with the name. And Lance United at the time, from all of the focus groups and the very detailed questioning we did, our supporters wanted a classic, more you know, global football name because of Atlanta and its history with, you know, the Civil War diversity. United was by far and away their choice. But when we revealed it, we got a lot of pushback, more from outside Atlanta, from other clubs, because in America, the nickname is much more gimmicky. You know, it's Lakers. So people couldn't get their heads around. Even the commissioner of the league had some concerns because he's like, well, there's already DC United. And I remember going to meet him with Arthur. We went to sort of fight our corner and it was explaining that, you know, the 92 clubs in England has 13 Uniteds. You know, United is not the nickname. United is just our identity and our name. The nickname is going to come from the supporters. And we don't want to force an artificial narrative on our supporters. And we don't know what they're going to come up with as a nickname. We need time for that to build. And, you know, within the first season, Five Strikes became the nickname our supporters give to the club. So that, I think, was a good example of how you can sometimes be guided by your supporters, but you can't, like, artificially say this is what you're going to do because you don't know what it is that they want. So that was an interesting one for me, that listen and respond. And so we did just a lot of that. And uh, the other thing was, as we were building the club, 
trial and error. So some things resonated, some things didn't. So um, I remember going to watch the Georgia American football um, team that's the college football team. It's huge in the South. Georgia at the moment are the national champions. I went to one of their games and they do what they call the dog walk. So the team parks the buses and they go through this this channel of supporters and it's a crazy atmosphere. So think like arriving for a Champions League game, but on steroids. So when we played at Bobby Dodd Stadium, which is where Georgia Tech played, we thought, let's try it out. So we, we parked the bus with our team. We had a walk where people could line up to see the players coming into the stadium. We put the golden spike, which I'll come on to in a minute, which is our theme around the railway. And it was a huge hit. So now we do that at every Mercedes-Benz Stadium game. But that was just an example of something that we took from that sort of culture in the South from a different sport that really resonated with the fans. And then we just built off that. So it was, it was interesting. We just tried to lean into those things that our supporters identified with. Um, and it really just grew, grew organically. And we see that with the spike. So the spike was something that came, one of our big supporters groups called Terminus Legion. Uh, Atlanta's name used to be Terminus because it was the end of a railway line. That was the name of the city. So Terminus Legion had a train theme. That was our our first real big supporters group and it's still our biggest or one of our biggest supporters groups that's part of the Gulch, uh, the big area that we have where our fans are, are rowdy and proud for the matches. And so, you know, trains is something that, you know, Atlanta is known for. So when two railway uh, tracks intercede, you have a spike and a golden spike is used for those moments when, you know, it's, it's two big railway tracks meeting. So the golden spike was something we had gold as our colors that we took as a theme. And uh, we always wanted to, the hardest thing I think, Alex, for us was how do you create those rituals? So, you know, you think of things like you'll never walk alone at Liverpool that builds up over a, you know, a number of years. We were trying to think, we wanted to do something post-match that was a ritual for our supporters, but we wanted to do it win, lose, or draw. So the Tim, Portland Timbers do a great thing where they carve off, um, they have a lumberjack as their mascot. He carves off a piece of a log and whoever scores for the team gets a memento of a log at the end of the game and if the goalkeeper keeps the clean sheet. But of course, if they lose the game 2-0, nothing happens at the end of that game. And I was like keen to try and come up with something that we did win, lose or draw. So what we do is before the game, we have this big golden spike. So, you know, America's great for just doing things grand and spectacular. But so we have a massive golden spike. When the team comes into the stadium, what I talked about, the spike walk before the game, the team will sign it. And then we let all of our fans sign this massive golden spike. Then the supporters group all pick one person for every home game, which is great for them because it's a way for them to encourage membership. They carry that spike then into the stadium and down to a big capo stand that we have just on the side of the pitch in front of our supporters group. And we've got a massive like um, mock train track. The spike goes into it and then we have a, a, a celebrity sort of, um, you know, influencer that comes before the game. And when the teams are about to come out, they have a massive hammer and they hit it to the ATL chart. So A, T, L. And it could be Big Boy from, you know, Outcast. We have a Van der Holyfield. Who you had? Tell me some, some of the guests. That yeah, yeah. On. So we've had, you know, Van der Holyfield. We had uh, Tiffany Haydish last week, um, famous comedian actress over here. We've had Ron Howard, the director. Uh, so we've had like various influence come in and they do that at the start. But then the game gets played and near the end, our fans then vote who they're, golden spike of the matches, so man of the match in effect. And win, lose or draw, that person comes up. So literally up into the supporter section, they get a real genuine sort of life-size spike. And we've got a proper railroad and we've got 17 holes for the 17 matches. They hammer that spike in and they get one to keep. So it's a symbol of the connection between our fans and the players because every game they come and do it. But also now we've got a history. So six years and counting of every match with the spike in from from every game. And so for us, that's our way of starting to build that history. And, you know, you're hoping in 30 years, a grandfather's bringing, you know, his grandchild and he's like, oh, I remember that game when Miguel Almiron scored the hat trick against Houston. And, you know, that was the match I was at. So you're having to sort of think ahead of how can you create these rituals and, and moments that sort of galvanize the, the club, but also around things that are real and authentic and genuine to the city. And I think, you know, the spike is something that's really resonated and and it's something that throughout the, the whole match day has a sort of a journey as you go through the day. It feels very authentic, doesn't it? It feels like you've taken something real, uh, true to the identity of the city and you found a way creatively to um, incorporate that into 
the fan experience of uh, of going to the match. So yeah, I'm just sort of trying to wonder how that could fit with certain English football clubs. Maybe that's a conversation for another day. Yeah. But what so I would say about that one, though, is I had a view. So I'm, I'll be honest, like when I came, I had a view of what football culture is. You know, so I, I was very... Um, protective early on of not we do want to be accused of being a plastic club you know coming and doing something inauthentic but even I was surprised because I didn't know what I didn't know so what I love about and you know I love we'll get you and Paul to a game sometime here in Atlanta but what what's great about it is it's unique to America and Atlanta so the tailgate before the games like in my head I was like ah do we want to do tailgates that's American football but the reality is it's a Atlanta United version of the tailgate and it's something that's genuine to the South. Uh, then when you go to the match and you hear the songs, so we have songs that are in Spanish that are taken from South America. We have the Viking ATL clap that, you know, a lot of clubs have done, but everything's taken from different areas, but it makes it a uniquely Atlanta experience. And that's what I think, you know, I sort of probably would have had my view of what I thought it was going to be like. And then what you realize quite quickly is you just let the supporters go with it and you just you help them in areas where things are working, the rituals that rituals that, that they enjoy, we sort of lean into it. So the tailgate, before every match, I go to the tailgate. And I do that for a number of reasons. One, because that's how we, we built the club. We built the club in grassroots, going and having a drink with our supporters, meeting them where they were. Secondly, I think, you know, for us, we did a great job of having that connection between the front office and the supporters. And what I don't want to do is now we're, you know, top 10 club in the world in attendance. We suddenly go into our ivory tower and we say, right, job done. We're just going to let you guys get on with it. So for me, it's great because I get real time feedback that's not filtered through five layers. I hear if, you know, they're upset about the beer in section 132. You know, I'll quickly get told as I'm walking in that, that tailgate. And then the other fact, I think, is you're sending a message to all of our associates that, the way that we built this club and the reason that we have success isn't accidental. It's because we literally had to win the hearts and mind of every supporter. And if you just stop the tap, it's not like a tap that you can turn on and off. You stop it, then they're going to go off. And we talked about it earlier. They'll go and watch the Braves or they'll go to concerts or they'll go and do something else with their time. So it's really yeah. important that we never forget that we have built that connection. And it doesn't mean that it's always going to be you know, sweetness and light because there'll be some issues that you have to face up to with the supporters but it's a heck of a lot easier if you've had a genuine dialogue with them to talk through so, some of those moments that are more difficult than if you're you know never having that interaction except for when you know things are going well and you're sort of once a year going to do a i don't know like a supporters trust round table so i think for me that's something that is really important for the success we've had and the continued sex success is that you have that dialogue and that close connection between the club and the supporters and the danger is the moment that you have a disconnect the moment you start to assume that you're always going to have those supporters is the moment that you're doomed the other element of atlanta culture that i want to touch on atlanta culture and fan culture as a whole is music and specifically hip-hop atlanta's a city known for its hip-hop and that's also something that you integrate into the essence of atlanta united isn't it yeah, and we were, we were very fortunate, again, because we're in a, an amazing city that's got a great history. You know, it's the hip-hop real center now and capital of, of the United States. But it's obviously something that is important to the city. So as we were building the club, as we were talking about all of those factors that our supporters wanted the club to embody, you know, hip-hop and the music scene is naturally something that comes up from that. Uh, and we were really fortunate. I spoke about our supporters group. So we've got six official supporters groups. And they have different personalities. So we actually have one called Footy Mob based on Goody Mob that is more of the, you know, they're into the music scene, into the hip hop. So we already had a section of our supporters group that are, you know, very focused on the music scene. And so as we've been building the club, it's almost happened organically and naturally. So you mentioned about Waka Flocka Flame. So one of our biggest supporters and one of our supporters before we'd even had a team. So we were launching our first ever kit, the Five Stripes kit, the black and red that was gonna be the first ever kit for Atlanta United. And we actually did it in a music venue called the Tabernacle in downtown Atlanta. So historic um, you know, music venue right in the middle of downtown Atlanta. And Walker Flocker was gonna be one of our models. He was really interested in soccer. He was interested in the culture that was building around the club. So when we launched that, we had the men in blazers do the sort of hosting, but Walker Flocker was one of our models wearing the shirt. So it was 
that was before we'd even kicked a ball. You know, he then got actually got a ring when we won the trophy in uh, 2018. So a very American thing here is you do these massive bling rings that, you know, our ring had the sort of skyline of Atlanta and 50 million, you know, diamonds in it. But Waka Flocker is, you know, he was someone that was one of our team ambassadors. So when we gave the rings out to the players, Waka came to present them. And then we had a surprise that we'd made one for him as well. So, you know, he was someone that was with us right from the start. Um, uh, out, you know, when we had Outcast, Big Boy came to do the spike. The great thing about it is everyone's coming because they want to come to a match. So this isn't a case where you're going out saying, all right, we're going to have to pay for influencers. And that's the best way to do it because they're coming because they want to, and then they're engaging through, you know, a real authentic way. So they'll be doing it on their own channels. Uh, so that's what I love about it. And our fans love it too, because they come to every game and it's like, who's it going to be today? And you, you never know. It might be, you know, you know, the mayor, okay, you know, the mayor of Atlanta, you've got to have the mayor do his civic duty. But then, you know, it is, like I said, Evander Holyfield or it's Ron Howard because he's filming something in the city. And we're very fortunate in Atlanta. We have the music scene and we also have the movie scene because uh, all of the Marvel movies are made in Atlanta. There's actually now more of the top 100 films made in Atlanta than Hollywood. So, you know, whether it's Owen Wilson, we'll just get calls from people the day before the game saying, look, can we come to a match? And you know, we're, we love that when they're reaching out to us because we know that they're interested. Well, we're going to put a link up for our audience to, sh to see a video that you did with Waka Flocka. And I don't think we've quite got time today to go into it, but it's um, absolutely worth watching. It's hilarious. It's um, MLS, MLS Cup or playoffs qualification, if I'm right. And you and Waka Flocka um, performing in the boardroom, standing on, sta on, uh, on the table rapping grime tunes at each other it's absolutely fantastic and i fully recommend that everybody has a listen to it and so whack a flocker that could only be done at atlanta the spike it feels like that could only be done in at atlanta um my instinctive reaction is that these things could only work in the us because this side of the pond we're a little bit shy we're a little bit timid we don't necessarily want to put ourselves out there quite as much would you agree with that? Or is this something that actually, it's not just something that the U US audience wants. And this is something which could be replicated elsewhere. And let's say hypothetically, final question, Darren, hypothetically, if you were to move back to the Premier League and take up a role at an English Premier League club, what have you learned from the MLS and what would you bring over? Or do you feel like it's just been a unique MLS and Atlanta only experience which couldn't be replicated over here? No, I mean, it's a great question. It's funny because it's always a question I get back in England is, you know, what you brought from England to make Atlanta United success. And I think, to be honest, it's the other way around. I've learned far more here in the United States. And I think it's more, not just from MLS, but I think, you know, from a, from a building a club, whether it's American football, um, soccer, Major League Baseball. I spoke a little bit about it. Like, for me, it's about listening to the supporters and I get it you know I was in Premier League football for you know 11 12 years um, you've got waiting lists because you know people are fans because the mum and dad were fans or their grandparents were fans and I think there's a tendency to take the supporters for granted you've got this huge TV deal that you know that that revenue is coming in you can't afford to do that when you're in America because you're not only fighting the other professional sports but you're fighting college sports which is just as big so I think that what I found really interesting, my biggest takeaway is th this idea of listening and responding with the supporters in mind. If you do that, if you make every decision through the lens of, is this something that's good for the sport or something the sport want, you just make good business decisions. It's not that you're sort of going out of your way to do things that makes your job more difficult. You're actually doing things that are more successful. And I think, you know, for me, that's been my biggest learning. Wherever I've had a nagging doubt at the back of my mind on a on something it's usually because if i think about it that's probably going to antagonize the supporters in some way and why would we do that when we could do it this way and bring the supporters along with us and i think what you get with that is you get the fan base that we've got so you know we're a brand new club in a sport that is number four in the country but you know we're in the top 10 in the world in global attendance and that's because you know we think about our supporters and we do things and we build the whole club around them but that's great business sense because we're getting the revenue we're getting a supporter base that's really engaged. So commercial partners are excited to work with us because they know our supporters are totally engaged in the club and are more passionate advocates, and they're going to be more passionate advocates of their brand. 
So for me, it's not necessarily taking things we've done at Atlanta and doing that in the Premier League. It's taking the approach of how do we think about what our supporters want um, and then in that lens make those decisions that are more sensible business-wise. And we've seen it a little bit. We have a minority share in Aberdeen uh, up in the Scottish Premier League. And you know, Aberdeen's done a great job of they've tried to focus on that younger audience that I think you know we've seen that in and you're seeing it in the Premier League where you know a lot of young people they can't get into the stadiums, whether it's because of the season ticket waiting list or the price is too high. Um, so in Aberdeen, they did a focus, they created an area, they called it the Red Shed. They tried to make it the area where the young people went to, and they did a great job. They sold it out within six months, but all that was was saying, okay, what's the problem that we've got here, or what are we trying to find a solution for where we might have disenfranchised supporters, and how can we create it? And so they, they were just thinking about that. So that was just a small example of if you are thinking through the lens of the sport, I think you can realize not only a better atmosphere, um, a better relationship with the supporter base, but also it makes more business sense. You know, that ultimately I think is the, is the best learning I've got from the United States is if you take that approach, it's a win-win for everybody. Darren, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate it. And if you want more of this sort of content, make sure you're following this podcast on your preferred podcast platform. If you liked this, the full episode will be available on footballcode.com and check out the show archives for more of the same. Thanks very much.